that, what I would like to go ahead and bring up uh, Joe Klein. Joe's been involved in IPv6 sort of security and hacking for as long as I can remember. Shame on me for mentioning such a, disparage you in such a way, <laughs> but uh, has some interesting security things to go over. So with that, I turn it over. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Joe Klein. I'm a scientific hooligan because I don't like the word hacker anymore. By the way, scientific hooligan was actually from a newspaper article in 1903 where Marconi was presenting how wonderful the wireless telegraph was and how nobody could ever intercept it, nobody could modify it, and nobody could transmit on back to him well, the newspaper article actually talked about how strange it was that curses and other funny things were showing up on his wireless telegraph, which was not from the other side. Um, and the newspaper article talked about this guy who was a scientific hooligan that did it. It turned out to be somebody six blocks away that was a professor that pretty much knew how to figure out a frequency and knew how to type Morse code. So anyway, um, I've been part of IPv6 for a long time. A lot of these are old friends out here. Um, you can find um, uh, information about me on the scientifichooligan.me if you want to find some strange rants. OK, scope of the cybersecurity problem. I read a lot of these PDFs. I read a lot of these studies, probably have four more in my in basket this week. What's the cost of cybersecurity? I, I really don't know. Right now, it could be millions, billions, trillions. Everybody's making estimates based on their place in the world because there's really no measurements. How many records have been compromised? Well, only those that the organization's going to be held liable for. But what other records have been compromised? Again, I don't know, you don't know, I know I've worked in a lot of incidents where I've been brought in from a forensic standpoint that it was never disclosed. It was never disclosed to law enforcement, it was never disclosed outside of a small circle of people and they were pretty big compromises. Um, how many systems and network applications have been compromised? Again, millions, billions, trillions, again, no real measurement. Uh, there's a lot of discussion on it. At this point, I can only assume it's a lot of money. Everything's been compromised from a privacy standpoint. All your records have been compromised, and mine. And that every system is already pre-compromised as a present from your vendor. So that's the way I see the world. Um, here are the levels of attack or the classes of attack we're seeing at this point. Um, uh, we can only solve one, we can only influence a couple other ones. We really don't have as network engineers, system admins, as others. IPv6 doesn't allow us to influence unless we can convince them to fix this problem. Um, uh, flaws in technology, be it uh, an RFC, be it implementation, be it coding, be it you know end of life issues, we can have some influence on that. Governance unless you can convince management to do something, you really don't have a control on governments. Um, flaws in people, people will click links. Links are cute. People will click links. Some links end up in spam. Um, also, uh, inadequate funding and staffing. We're all seeing downsizing of staffing, in both in security, networking, whatever. That causes problems. We also have um, another class of user, which is disgruntled employees, insiders, uh, uh, people trying to make money off the data that's inside. We keep on seeing lots of press about, you know, student records being sold, credit cards being sold, blah, blah, blah. Um, untrained users, again, users clicking on links, clicking on links within SMSs. Do you know that there are you have the capability of putting a IPv4 or IPv6 address and a link in an SMS and having somebody being sent off to any type of website and opening the browser unprotected. It's kind of frightening. 
Um, and also the vendor supply chain. We've seen a lot of compromise of vendor products recently. So we're not going to talk about all of it. We're going to talk about one little piece of it. This is an interesting breach report. Uh, Verizon puts that one out uh, every six months. It's a good read for those that have to justify doing security uh, on your environment. Uh, I want to mention the 85% of breaches uh, which took place took a week or more to discover. In some cases, a year to two years. So some of these breaches are long-term issues. And also, I find it funny that 92% of the time, it's a third party that finds out your system is breached. Is that kind of frightening as far as you know our security models, our, all the toys and tools that we have that are supposedly securing our environment? Kind of don't work. So um, a friend of mine and a mentor, uh, Richard Baitlick, uh, very well known in the field as far as dealing with incident handling. That's his, his bailiwick. He focuses on how do I fix the problem. He pretty much gave up and he said, you know, the best companies aren't the ones that stop the attacks. Um, it's important that the companies can spot the intrusion quickly and respond to them with limiting damage. Um, over the last 10 years, I've been involved in incidents with IPv6. Most of the time, they didn't even have instrumentation to find that they were compromised. In some cases, they didn't have instrumentation even to know that they were being DDoS. They saw the CPU on their uh, router go up or their firewall go up to 100%. They'd watch systems reboot. They really didn't have any context about anything going on because they didn't have the tools to view IPv6. And a lot of the presentations earlier talked about it. Make sure you have proper implement, uh, instrumentation, things that can actually see IPv6 packets are happening uh, on the environment. So uh, he also goes on to say, this idea that you can stop an intrusion uh, just as doesn't hold up. Uh, against certain threats. Um, these threats are, the term is uh, APT. Oh, by the way, for those on video, uh, the words APT and cyber are part of a drinking game, so you are four drinks behind. It's a typical drinking game in this field. Um, the threats are really identified threats. Most organizations have assets, intellectual property, address books, um, uh, patents, processes that are being compromised or have been compromised. We see it on a regular basis um, that all of a sudden this particular product that only this company made suddenly shows up in another company country and they suddenly have a competitor out of the blue with no research and development, just suddenly customers, product lists, price lists, everything else. We've been seeing that for about the last five years. And it's, for a lot of us, it's very frustrating. Here's our current model. Woohoo! We can put up a castle. Uh, I worked in one environment that the whole solution was, you know, we need to put more gnats in. We need to put in our gnats in. They turned around and they had uh, 1,200 um, endpoints uh, and sites. They put in a gnat between themselves and their core. And then they had to actually manage all this by hand. They ended up increasing their staffing to 12 people every time they had to make a subtle change because they didn't have anybody to script anything. So the cost on security went way up from a, from a um, uh, security standpoint from a staffing standpoint. The more interesting part is it didn't help. There was no measurable improvement of throwing up all of these gnats every place. So this model, I think it's pretty broke at this point. I think we can all agree that the not only the gnat security model, but tall walls just don't work. Um, do you know why castles and forts are really not an issue anymore? Because now we have nuclear devices that kind of wipe them out and it's a non-issue anymore. Well, guess what? Some of the security problems we have maybe aren't nuclear, but they're pretty bad. So we don't need those, those walls and things are a real problem. 
within the last four years has been a, a, a rethink of the security models that we're using. Um, we have a fortress type um, impenetrable, hopefully, by, again, based on the studies, probably not. Uh, it's monolithic, it's single layered, it's rigid, it's impenetrable. It may be multi-layer with NATs, with firewalls, whatever. But we have another model that people are now thinking about. Um, the research community, security research community, saying, wow, what if we have partial borders? What if we have heterogeneous, not just homogeneous, just a specific vendor's product? We actually put a couple different products in. What if we have uh, real defense in depth instead of just firewalls every place or IDSs every place, which is very problematic? Well, thank you. Um, I get that with... Never mind. Um, also, it has to adopt, learn, and evolve. And sometimes it really doesn't need a human in a loop to do some of these things. Right now, uh, I think the study was done four years ago that it takes a typical firewall entry to be inserted from the time that there's a business need through change control, through the actual uh, testing process till the time it's applied, about two days. So it's about, you know, it's a lot of hours as the attacker has an open, especially when they're dealing with milliseconds and you're dealing with hours. Kind of uh, very difficult. And also the ability to have a, a model that's survivable. Let's go into some detail. Um, it's interesting that the body has kind of standardized on about 20 to 30 percent of the body resources are specifically for the surveillance and containment of these unknown issues. Um, unfortunately, from a security perspective, that's not what we spend because we buy lots of bricks and mortars. And a lot of the tools that would actually be used to do this shouldn't be that expensive, but they're starting to get very expensive. So let's talk about RFC 1918. Has anybody really read RFC 1918 from a security perspective? Well, they define this model. This model is broke. It's actually based on the Fortress model. So it says all the nodes and routers are going to trust each other outside on the internet. And then your DMZ, they're going to trust each other. But everything is also trusted inside the firewall and NAT. Therefore, what you have is you have the ability to uh, trust anything, especially if it has a single firewall rule. So this, this is pretty broke. We've added some things, like we've added, added Mac layer protection. Um, we've, you know, we've put host-based firewalls, which have added some additional levels of complexity. Um, but this model is pretty broke. It's hard to manage. Um, it's hard to, it's actually hard to defend. And by the way, this is the model we currently use that is being compromised. So let's talk about a different model. Uh, RFC 3756, which is really a rethink using IPv6. This was uh, a rethink based on the first hop security. And what it goes into is it says, look, we're still going to need blind trust of devices on the net, but those devices should now be authenticated. So I have to authenticate to the system, be it at the layer two or be it at layer three, whatever. But we, we now need to really do this. But we also make an assumption that the host nor the routers are going to put out false information. And we're to be, be able to detect it hopefully, if that occurs. Can we currently do that with IPv6? Detect any of this information? Detect link, uh, lo uh, local connections? Well, in most networks, no. Um, the next level of trust is the public wireless, which is what most of us are using around here, either the Wi-Fi or through the cell phone infrastructure, which is we as individuals don't trust each other, so we VLAN it off, we provide separation so we can't communicate back and forth, but we trust the router. Well, routers historically have been used for man-in-the-middle attacks. We've seen link-local attacks. Uh, Scott gave some 
um, examples of man in the middle attacks with just a few packets uh, where I would become the router. Oh, let me tell you a story about that, by the way. So I get a call about a month ago. This is a new data center. They put about $22 million into this data center. They had it all set up. It was all the newest and shiniest equipment. They had it all set up for IPv4. Life was good. But the administrators were loading systems up and not joining them to the domain. These were Microsoft systems. And then suddenly, sometime in the middle of the day, all their IPv4 traffic started decreasing and they couldn't figure it out. Uh, apparently somebody was messing with IPv6 and set their system up as a default router and misconfigured Teradose so it was trying to communicate out through the internet with all these Microsoft boxes via V6. Took about three, four hours, cost them ten, fifteen thousand dollars to fix it because it stopped operation for a while. Um, good example of knowing if tunnels exist and doing tunnel protection in your environment. Um, again, trusting the router upstream. Is your router IPv6? Is it IPv4? And can it be trusted? Um, by the way, this is a real well-known um, attack that can be used on wireless and wired infrastructure. So the last thing is really the ad hoc, which is trust but verify, host and transit. I kind of refer to it as the DEF CON mode. And that is if you go to the hacker conference DEF CON, you don't trust anything. There's actually a blast zone about a mile around that you don't use anything in. Uh, right, Sam? <laughs> um, you, don't, uh, you don't use ATMs, you don't use cell phones, you don't use wireless. Everything's pre-compromised if you even get close. So um, this really has a different type of mode, which is I don't trust the uh, router and I need some kind of root of trust. I need some kind of validation before I communicate with this. Um, this is where send becomes important, is to change and allow us to have a different kind of model so that we can go on to untrusted networks. Right now our current mode is that we turn our firewalls up, we put our shields up, kind of like putting walls up, but we don't, we still don't validate trust of our upstream router. We still don't validate trust of other things. So as an example, um, I noticed that uh, from the hotel I'm currently staying in, I noticed that um, doing a little testing, because I'm really, I have fun testing, I noticed that somebody was doing an SSL intercept of my certificates. So that was a little bit disturbing um, to find that, so I stopped using the connection. Um, but these are the kind of modes we're going to have to start designing to in the future. So over the last four years, this new survivability um, model has been uh, taking place, uh, first at Carnegie Mellon and now at MITRE. Um, it's called Resilience and Agility. And it's really focused on uh, preparing for that inevitability that you are going to be compromised. Right now we say, oh, we're not going to be compromised, we'll just build taller walls. But if I was to be compromised, what am I going to prevent? And how do I actually detect that that particular issue um, has been compromised? How can I withstand it within my network that if the system is truly compromised, that I can take it offline in a very fast manner or redirect it into another VLAN or do something. How do I actually think about doing that? How do I um, estimate the time of loss and be able to meter that so I can provide management some kind of number because they like numbers? Um, and then how fast can I recover uh, from a, uh, a data breach? Do I have to reinstall one piece? Do I have to reinstall a whole piece? A, um, Am I rest restoring from today's data? Am I restoring from six months data? By the way, an interesting story that is still not only true, but has been taking place for years. Um, some people that do operating system backups don't actually create a gold backup that's from the day that they created it and made sure it was protected. Um, we're seeing a lot of real interesting issues where uh, an organization may have a three-month backup cycle 
and the attacker actually compromised them four months ago. So the compromise is actually a rootkit that sits in their kernel, in their router, in their whatever for multiple months. So every time they recover, it's back again. And they recover again, and it's back again. So be aware that this is a, this is a growing, evolving problem that's actually touching a lot of us. And also adaptability of change. Um, the changing processes, systems, uh, making sure training is uh, available um, when needed. Uh, here are the techniques specifically for resilience and agility. Uh, I thought I only had 45 minutes, so I only provided one scenario of application, but I could ran on this topic for hours in some of the studies that I've done. Uh, IPv6 matches to this. If you look at the adaptive, uh, adaptive containment, integrity, isolation, randomness, and unpredictability, least privilege, uh, cyber uh, maneuvering, um, somebody presented yesterday the ability to cyber maneuver through a local segment and also across multiple networks. Um, that's, that's part of this. Uh, topology hiding, deceptive uh, detection attributes, and prioritization. Uh, those are the ones that are directly attributable that we can apply to IPv6 as new defensive techniques that are actually very cool um, once you see it. The problem with it is now we're going to have to think differently. We have to stop thinking the IPv4 way uh, once we get into this domain. So again, um, Let's focus on specific, uh, something called ISR, Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance. This is an issue where the attacker will turn around and footprint your environment. Right now in V4, what do we have? It's very quick. Actually, I have a slide on that. Um, it's very quick. Um, it used to take a month to do. Now the whole internet is actually being scanned daily by one specific group. Uh, well, actually several, but uh, one specific group in the United States that's actually on Russian servers, which confuses the heck out of people if, if they're not aware of what's going on. Um, the ability to know that information, well, it's interesting, the intelligence also includes Google, includes about your people, it includes, oh, um, I'm now starting to see examples of address plans with individual internal addresses show up as PDFs on the internet. Great for research. If somebody's going to go uh, attack a large company, please don't do that. This is like providing your network diagram to the attacker so they know which router to hop through to get to where your goal is. We also have surveillance. Um, the surveillance is really the regular scanning of ports and, uh, just to see if they're open and, or closed. Um, again, we see it through layer three, through layer 10. Um, and also reconnaissance, which is enumerating what services and trying to do a deeper enumeration. I am running this particular web server, I'm running, running this particular module, uh, whatever. Uh, IPv6 gives us a unique capability of pushing this ISR process out to be able to detect the attackers long before they're actually going after your environment. Uh, by the way, all three of these are sold as services. There are companies that you can look at your own IP range and your own uh, systems to find out what ports and protocols are open exposed because they sell that information to others about what your organization looks like. So if a new zero day or a new um, vulnerability with code is released right now there's the capability of Googling for that code, compiling that code, doing a search through this database on any system in the world that's potentially compromisable, and within minutes be able to compromise tens, hundreds, thousands, millions of systems. So this information is real critical to know about your own organization, um, especially in V6 when we start talking about some of the issues. Um, also realize that there's two ways surveillance is done. One is the inbound, that is people are sending packets to your firewall, to your routers to determine what parameters they support. We also have outbound. We have web browser users. 
Matter of fact, I was, um, yesterday, I have a little program on my Mac called Little Snitch. And what Little Snitch does is it gives me information of what's trying to communicate out. Didn't realize that Apple had four programs that provide not only the IP address, but information about me so they can bind it to something that they sell, which is a little bit strange. But then I also found that Google does the same thing. When you log into Google, it tries to authenticate and then starts tracking you around the internet with cookies also. Those cookies are now bound to your IPv4 or IPv6 address. Okay, so it's something to be aware of. Um, and again, this whole ISR technique, it's used really as a pre-attack. Um, uh, by the way, uh, a lot of these people are doing this for money, uh, gaining access to your, uh, your intellectual property, your customer list, whatever, it makes some people some real money. Oh yes, and there are researchers like me that from time to time also do this. So the attacker assumptions. Here's the IPv4 attacker assumption. This is wonderful to realize that they still think there's a single IP address per interface. Isn't that special? We can use that against them. Um, we also have an assumption on v4 that all inbound addresses are the same outbound addresses. Privacy addresses, temporary addresses. Hmm? Devices say the same thing over time. They're static. We don't move addresses. We bind them to a place and they sit there until they burn down, they get old, and we change them out. Um, and it's the same inside address and the same local address, physical placement. Um, also, if the system is responding or not responding, the attacker figures out that one of two things they, they did. They either threw packets at it and it crashed it, or that uh, now they're being blocked. So what they'll do is they'll come back a little bit later, maybe a day or a week, a month, based on the attacker, and they will try it again to see if the system was rebooted because your job is to reboot that system so they get to know that it's still there, right? No. So this IPv4 thinking, again, the, I, I talk to a lot of security people about this, this IPv4 thinking is what gives us a real edge, finally, on defining some of the attackers. So problem right now, script kitties can grab a copy of Nmap or dozens of other tools to scan the network. They can use brute force, they're using single address, there's there's high uh, population density, so they can compromise a, a single network very, very quickly. Um, from the source standpoint, from where they're coming from, uh, they're in a needle in a haystack. The ability to actually do attribution back to where they're coming from is extremely difficult in V4. Uh, they could also use fast and slow techniques. As an example, if uh, depending on how you have your IDS tuned, I can uh, show up in your IDS as a ping sweep if I do it under 15 minutes. I send two or more within 15 minutes. If I do it outside that range, I don't show up on your radar at all. So essentially, I'm hiding in the data. Um, I can use um, other techniques. I can fragment the addresses. I can use NATs to hide behind uh, different tunnel techniques. Attribution is really hard at this point. Uh, we've seen a lot of cases where they thought the attacker was from some place and when they actually did the forensics on the box, they found that somebody broke into the box and actually used that as a jumping point, a pivot point to attack other systems. So this is very problematic. Again, in V4, um, six minutes. What do you think? Uncompromised machine, six minutes to be compromised and it's gotten better. So, why I'm talking about this is I've had an unpatched box now for two years. It's not been found on an IPv6 segment at a university. No pings, no ping sweeps, no anything. I've not seen any noise on the interface. They're asking me why I'm so crazy to have it still sitting there. 
I'm not seeing this kind of uh, issue in V6 today. Brute force, uh, these were the current studies, as uh, I mentioned. Uh, we now decreased to, uh, from 298 days to one day. Uh, there is a massive ping that takes place from a bunch of virtualized systems uh, in Russia, and they ping everybody. Isn't that a win? And they also port scan everybody to find out what ports, and then that data is sold to different people as a asset. So your interfaces and ports and applications are sold to potentially be compromised. It's very, very disturbing. V6, we have lots of different uh, addresses, uh, scanning um, the dumb way, the brute force way. And as the speaker said yesterday, um, I also received the same kind of call from a customer. They said, oh my god, I am two weeks and this guy is trying to ping sweep me and it's it's, it's at, and he gave me the address, and I said, well, where's your server? Well, his address, address was way up in the address range. And I said, well, that's good. When do you retire? He said, well, I'm retiring in about 22 years is what I'm expecting. I said, well, leave this to somebody else because it's going to be about 45 years before they're going to find your server, so don't worry about it. Um, this, this whole idea of this dumb scanning is, for me, it's hilarious because I've been talking about it now for six years and people are still doing it. It's just brilliant. Let's talk about some smart scanning techniques. Current technique is uh, you scan the whole internet for IPv4 ranges. You then take your host name and you do a reverse lookup and you find your dual stack IPv6 devices. You now scan that. Done. Oh, by the way, the blacklist that all your vendors said that they can't provide you, please go back and teach them how to do this because I've had this for several of my customers for the last two years. And this is actually mapped to IPv6 devices that are mapped to IPv4 devices that are compromised or have malware on them or spam relays. So this is a real easy process to take care of for yourself. Um, this, this will hit about, this will hit the vast majority of bad systems within IPv6. To get every device on an IPv6 network, there's also some smart scanning that takes place. They'll find an address and they'll assume that the administrator statically addressed everything sequentially or they created it as um, a cluster. So they have a single address and they'll start scanning around that cluster of addresses to find if there's any other addresses. They'll use things like, you know, dead beef and deed and abed and uh, things like that. There's databases out there for scanning this now. Um, they'll use patterns. Um, a common pattern, by the way, is that at a Cisco Live event four years ago, Recommendation was that you map the VLAN for your organization into the network section of an IPv6 address. So the attackers have figured this out and most people use usually a five spacing between their VLANs or a 10 spacing between their VLANs. So that became a pattern that made it easier for the attackers to find your systems. Um, port scans. A lot of people are using um, 53 for their DNS, 80 for their web server, 25 is their address for their uh, email server. Um, be aware, it's, it, the studies are saying 80 to 90% of the devices out there fit within these categories. Also, uh, almost 90% of the routers are a dot one or a dot two or a dot three. So for identif identification of the, the attacker to figure out if you have routing infrastructure out there. Um, why is this important, by the way, from a routing infrastructure? Um, we really seen a couple quote unquote pings of death, yes I am that old, um, that, that have occurred that impact systems. Uh, we have the uh, Malforn RAs for Microsoft systems on link. Uh, we see the ping pong attack, we see other type of attacks. Um, with the ability to identify what this address is without doing trace routes and you know other things, it again gives the attacker an edge up and hopefully helps you protect your infrastructure. 
Well, the other thing is, does your firewall detect this kind of thing? I've noticed from a firewall vendor standpoint, they're really not doing any smart targeting identification with any of these techniques. They won't tell you where the adversary is coming. They don't cluster that data. They don't provide any information, which is a real problem. Same thing with a DNS server. Most people see DNS server as a dumb box that sits in a corner, gives me addresses and name uh, resolution. That box is now going to become critical from a security standpoint. Uh, yesterday I asked a question about um, split brain, which is the ability to have a set of IP addresses get one view of a set of IP addresses and be able to do resolution on one set versus another. This is going to be a technique that's going to become more and more used uh, in the infrastructure to protect your, your tools. So, using the technique we just talked about, um, the um, agility attack, um, I put up a system six months ago. And here's what I did. I inserted an A record, and I res uh, put in a quad A record that didn't exist. Then I turn around and uh, figuring out that they're going to scan, I put a machine up. Um, the whole reason I did this was to poison their list. So as an example, somebody is scanning again besides um, uh, people we know. Um, other people are scanning the network and then they're using this as attack strategies to identify and to get into systems. Uh, once I did this, this actually fouls the attacker's list of where the targets are and they'll continuously come back. Again, that shows you that somebody's attempting to knock on the door. Somebody's going after you. I also installed a uh, honeypot. Um, specifically at that network address. And I'm getting one to two a week attempts at trying to get into this, uh, which is pretty interesting. So this is a good way of detecting somebody's attempting to compromise. Um, if you have an old machine, there's versions of Linux and honeypots you can put up that support quad A. Very easy to do, very easy to set up. Um, again, from an attacker standpoint, tells you that somebody's mucking or attempting to muck with your network. This is going over the, you know, over the bounds. Um, one of the big problems I see is a lot of people don't want to deal with the management of this. Uh, I would suggest taking a look at the IPAM tools, the address to manage the quad A's and be able to know which are deceptive and which are not, so you don't end up doing scanning and everything else around the space. So, wow, I got through it faster than I thought. I thought I'd rant for hours. Um, the survivability, um, IPv6 really has very little noise from a scanning standpoint at this point. The techniques and tools are developing, but being able to poison these people's lists early so that you can see if they're really coming after you um, is real important. Um, Use obscure names for real devices you have on your network, things that are within your organization. Uh, random addresses, don't use sequential addresses or something that's easy to guess. Um, separate your inbound and outbound, and I didn't go into that. Privacy addresses have a real benefit here, especially if you configure that every time you reboot your system, you get another privacy address, and you actually set the time down from the default of seven days down to a few hours. So what happens is you, every few hours it issues you a new address. So finding you on the internet or tracking you, what it does is it actually poisons all the advertisers' addresses of where you are, which makes it more difficult. It fills their database up. They get more false information about where you've been. Also, ensure that you click on your browser, again, via V6. Um, We've seen tools that we can check our IPv4 and IPv6 addresses on the same website. I started seeing advertisers do that this summer. So they're trying to capture and bind your IPv4 and IPv6 address together. Um, by the way, does anybody think that we can do geolocation on IPv6 addresses today? Any hands? Well, yes, you can. If you do a reverse lookup on all the IPv4 addresses and you match it to the IPv6 address, guess what? You just reference the IPv4 address in a dual stack environment. 
Yeah, I poisoned theirs. It was fun. So um, separating and adding privacy addresses, and again, managing this through an IPAM, makes it a lot easier to find the attackers and also keep yourself off the radar of the attackers. Um, a common thing is an example at DEF CON and a lot of, um, again, the IPv4 thinking. If I bind to an address to make a call out via my web server, the next thing that happens within a few seconds is somebody takes that address and starts scanning me via v4 or v6. So they'll start literally trying to attack your system. Um, the, the ability to separate these two provides you some leverage, which is pretty cool. And also, uh, there are additional techniques that exist to provide, again, pre-attack information uh, for you. Again, something that we really haven't been able to do with IIPv4 in the past because of uh, the, the lack of numbers. So, I only talked about one little tiny toolkit. This is a list of all the other toolkits that actually can be integrated into this and integrated into other things. Um, again, the size of the segment, local and network. Uh, EULAs, I know that a lot of people don't like ULAs, but the ability to have managed infrastructure with ULAs has some advantage. Um, just from a, only the scope of the addresses are viewable by me, especially if your DNS doesn't support split brain. Uh, send CGA, uh, Linux is the best way to do that. Microsoft won't get there for a while. Uh, CGA, IPsec, the ability to have tunnel after tunnel after tunnel. Um, I implemented this. It was pretty neat. We had uh, three different firewalls we had to go through and authenticate at higher levels of uh, communications. So uh, although it was slower because of the MTU size, we were able to provide communications inside this more um, protected infrastructure, which was pretty neat. Um, the I call it SETI, but it's basically, it's the Microsoft uh, domain isolation technique. That can be very useful in a lot of cases. Uh, Calypso, uh, I've been using Calypso for several projects recently. Has anybody heard of Calypso? They might use Calypso besides me. Okay, Calypso is something to be used in your, inside your infrastructure, not on, not on the public internet. And what it does, is it allows you to tag a system based on <clears throat> the confidentiality and the type of information that will be passing through that packet from that machine to other machines and be able to set up a set of services on your router to either deny and also track where it goes, which is very neat um, from my perspective. There's also an extension of that if you use um, access cards, uh, the military calls them CACs, is the ability to take uh, a hash of that CAC and we also have a user's communications tied to every packet that's transmitted, which again is out there, but eventually it's going to have to be done to protect against XFIL and other problems that are occurring. Um, we have the signed DHCP, which I guess we talked in Scott's um, class about the ability to have signed DHCP so you can at least trust your DHCP. Unfortunately, vendors haven't implemented that yet. Um, multicast uh, NTP saves on a lot of time, allows your synchronization to be better. Also, a, a, another issue is multicast signatures. Uh, I set up a prototype of signatures to multiple snort uh, devices. I had all of those bind to a multicast COI. And I was able to put together a script that if I had a signature that I wanted to apply, I would push that to my, that, that COI address, and it would distribute and apply in under a second um, 40 different uh, stored signatures. So instead of taking what usually took about 20 minutes, I was able to push that in, in a very, very short time. So that's, again, another security advantage of, of what V6 can do for us. Uh, leveraging DNSSEC, has anybody implemented DNSSEC? Uh, DNSSEC not only has the ability to provide um, 
trust as far as your DNS, but it also has the ability to be a public key store for your hosts, for uh, email communications and other things. This is, looks like it's going to be a big deal over the next few years. There's some prototype software to do this. This becomes real interesting if I'm doing an IPsec connection back and forth. The code is raw at this point to do this, but what I would do is if I'm gonna communicate with Scott, I would do a query against his trusted uh, DNA, uh, DNS server. He would do a trust against mine and we use that as our key, initial key exchange, which uh, makes key exchange a little bit different. Um, so that's been very handy. Uh, let's see. Uh, fast address move, uh, maneuvering. One of the advantages or one of the projects I dealt with was taking um, branches of Active Directory and readdressing them so all systems underneath those would then be readdressed. We would actually change the, the, the network that they were on so that literally the, that whole attack surface disappeared and would become a new uh, surface, a new connection. And then all the systems would update their addresses and their host names. Uh, it takes a little time, there are some glitches, but it looks like it's going to be a pretty neat way of avoiding DDoS and other things. Um, attribution's a lot easier at this point. Um, and also infra, uh, infrastructure hiding, the ability to hide your hop-to-hop um, uh, -hop connections, which I've used a couple times for um, attacks and for detection of attacks, which is pretty neat. Uh, some of the takeaways, uh, there are security, current security methods have failed. Um, there's too many compromises, our life is, you know, security, I don't care what you do, you're probably being hounded about security and access control lists and do this and do that and buy this new magic bullet and buy this new magic product because it'll solve all your problems. Um, it's, it really takes people to, to make that happen. This whole resilience and agility uh, movement, I have some links to some DHS and MITRE documents you may want to start thinking about as far as this agility uh, resilience um, movement. Uh, again, V6 is perfectly primed as the network protocol to support that. Uh, IPv6 is not about the, uh, the numbers, it's about giving you more capabilities from a security perspective. Uh, the one resilience technique that I just talked about um, is so easy, I'm surprised that all of the vendors that were unable to deliver blacklists over the last three years and have extended their ability to support blacklists over the three years, of all the products I guess uh, were discussed here, they should have been able to do this very quickly, but they I guess chose not to, so it's kind of frustrating. Um, otherwise, I guess I talked too quickly. Any questions up to this point? Because I have alternate slides. I knew Scott was coming up. Thank you, Scott. Oh, he was, pre he was prepared. Who prepared him with a mic? So Joe, I, I, yes. I was wondering if you could share with us any situations that you've seen in general, rather. You don't have to name names. Situations where an organization had rushed to deploy IPv6, <laughs> but it kind of failed to secure it to the level that they secure their IPv4 environment? Have you seen situations like that where it's led to a compromise? Yes. Um, first was a DNS server that they had to swap out their old uh, bind server. They didn't lock it down pro appropriately. They blocked ports on IPv4. They did not block ports on IPv6 for administration. It left the system open as they were managing it. The attackers rooted the system and sat there and watched all the machines because it provided a high level view of as machines were coming on. And they kept on getting probed and attacked and they couldn't understand how they knew that these random addresses were suddenly detected. DNS becomes really critical in this environment. You really need to protect your DNS. Um, others were tunnels. Um, <laughs> Does anybody know what the CCDC is? It's a cyber challenge uh, for college kids to see if they can defend an attack 
a bunch of systems. Um, I want to tell you a little, an interesting story about this, but it's a good example of thinking IPv4. The lead developer, one of the lead developers on Metasploit, a well-known attack tool, uh, called me up and said, hey, they decided to enable IPv6 and I knew nothing about it. And nobody else does and we expect that they're not going to do anything about it. And after about four hours, we walked through, we coded a really quick example to do some sweeps and pretty much all these students, I mean, these are brilliant students, people that really knew how to defend systems. All the systems were compromised. Actually, he showed up late for the event and they thought the students were really doing well until uh, he released this tool set. Compromised all the systems. That was eight pods of students. And they had to reset all the pods because the compromises were so deep. And he did it in under 15 minutes. So again, understanding that you have access control lists, understanding that you have you have um, DNS, you have web services, you have other things, you have to make sure the ACLs, the, the firewall rules. Um, also the web proxy rules, a lot of people will miss the web proxy rules to ensure that they're dual stack, which is really a problem. Let's see, and again tunnels, on a regular basis we're just, just like you Scott, I go into an environment and they say, we have no tunnels, we have no IPv6. And once you bring up and you show that they in fact do, and oh, by the way, those tunnels are going through their firewall and they're not really protecting against them, they get really concerned. And a lot of times they are, <laughs> this may have been occurring for months or years and may have been used for an exfil um, technique, which is pretty scary. Oh, by the way, um, does anybody know when the first compromise of an IPv6 system was? You should know this, Ron. No? 2001. It was one of the uh, uh, six to four systems that somebody compromised the system. And they had to look at the logs and they didn't real they realized they saw this magic address and they didn't know what it was and traced it back. Uh, after some email, they also found other people had been compromised by the same individual, um, all Debian um, Linux boxes. So compromises in this space have occurred for years. So you know when you're seeing it, if you don't have the instrumentation, you're not going to be able to detect it. Yes, I did. So I have a question in regards to lack of training in the security area. So I've, I've been working pretty, pretty diligently to try and get uh, systems and, and network folks to do adoption on IPv6. Have you noticed any specific problems with security teams not educating themselves and being basically at the tail end of, of, of V6 project implementations and putting the brakes on V6 getting rolled out specifically because they just don't have the talent, resource, and training to make it happen. You answered my own question. That was good. Uh, yeah, they, on a regular basis, we get the security people who have seen my videos on, hey, be prepared, know what you're doing, suddenly actually stop several large customers' uh, implementations, but they refuse to send anybody to class to learn about the protocol. They figure it's, it's just bad, so they don't need it. Um, it's, it's very frightening. Also, if you do have, do you, any of you have compliance done at your organization, be it Sorbanes-Oxley or FISMA or any of the other compliance, a real common problem is the auditors who are supposed to do validation, which protocols are working, which ports and, and, and other things are uh, opened or closed, have no idea what IPv6 is. So when they do their scans and they do their testing, they only do IPv4. Therefore, your whole layer of IPv6 is wide open. So the question I've been asking for the last four years of each of the compliance groups, which they really hate this, it's being a hooligan, I have a tendency to do ask those hard, difficult questions, is so if Auditor A did this assessment and forgot IPv6, but the standard says that you have to test for all network protocols. Who is liable? 
if you get compromised. The auditor for not completing, doing it in, in, in wholeness, or is it the company for not in, uh, having a policy that requires these people to do IPv6 assessments? So, so is your comment specifically around PCI in this particular case, or SOX, or what do you? Oh, I've been picking on everybody. There's 12 different organizations. Sorbanes-Oxley, Graham Leachman Bliley, FISMA, uh, FedRAMP, it, it goes on and on. Oh, by the way, if um, one of the more interesting observations I had recently is that the new NIST 853, which sets a bunch of controls up that makes recommendations, now has resilience controls. They're optional, but it gives you the ability to start seeing that at least the federal government sees this resilience thing is important. Although it's optional, it, uh, we're moving towards it, which is pretty neat. Any other questions? Did I stun you or do you need more coffee? <laughs> okay, well, I had one other thing I was gonna talk about, considering I do have time. <clears throat> I get asked all the time, Joe, where do you find these vulnerabilities? Well, I'm a bit of a geek. Um, here's the five places that I look. I look at the standards, um, design and architecture as an example this, um, this last summer. I spent a week trying to hack cars. It was fun, bad things happened, good things happened. I learned a lot. So I started reading the IEEE and ITU and other standards and found out that the chipsets are going to support IPv6 as the bridging te technology. Life is good. Unfortunately, there is going to be no testing on those chipsets, and the, uh, they're only going to use the MAC address as the last 64 for the radio. So what the objective is for Department of Transportation and others is the ability to have car-to-car -car communications and car-to-infrastructure as a safety functional feature. The real challenge here is that there's not a lot of people looking at that particular security, and it's just one of many transportation systems. We've also seen SCADA, which I looked at this spring, um, is attempting to take the packets and shove them into an IPv6 packet as a control mechanism, but the vendors are not getting trained and testing these systems at the appropriate uh, level. We've also seen healthcare providers now that 4G is available, the ability to take a 4G device and do real-time um, analysis on blood work, uh, any type, type of biological um, issue. We're seeing people developing in, in um, uh, for IPv6 or over IPv6, but there's not a lot of security thought going behind it. It's pretty much make it operational as quick as possible and get it out the door. So be aware that over the next few years, the Internet of Things are probably going to be more of a headache than our standard IT uh, systems. Oh yes, and the other one, I found my, my um, IPv6 enabled device I got for video was compromised. It had a Windows CE that was compromised, pre-compromised, it was pretty neat. So um, this whole Internet of Things be aware that there's going to be security implications to this. I know a lot of organizations will bring a TV into their conference room and plug it into their network and do other things. You may end up having a television being used to compromise your networks. Pretty frightening. Or um, bring your own device. I prototyped something up where I connected into a, using IPv6 and turning this into a tunnel device for the Wi-Fi infrastructure that I um, connected to. And it worked very well, by the way. So be aware that there's lots of opportunities to fix things. Um, get your security people trained. That's actually the biggest problem a lot of people have right now. Uh, whether it be picking up Scott's book or uh, taking a class, it's, it's really important at this point. Any other questions? If you want to ask me about the evil stuff, wait until I'm off the stage. Okay, and here's all my contact information. If you want to 
see what I'm up to, check out scientifichooligan.me uh, for whatever my recent rant, um, be it finding vulnerabilities in products or, uh, er, I'm back, there you go. Yes, please. Yes. Oh, one other interesting finding I've noticed throughout Europe and a few other countries that the reverse lookup is the address of the person that managed the endpoint, um, has the uh, slash 64 at the endpoint, or a geolocation. So I'm starting to see that a lot more from a geolocation mapping standpoint. So be aware of that from a privacy um, or uh, your own environment. Okay. Thank you.